Hello, Cornerstone family. We are so glad that you've joined us for service today. If you're new today, welcome. We would like to get to know you more and help you get plugged into the community. There are many ways to get connected. Either fill out a connection card in person and drop it in the offering box, or if you're watching over live stream, please click the I'm new button to find the form. We have two equipped classes starting soon. The first one is our baptism class. If you have accepted Jesus as Lord and Savior of your life, and you have not yet been baptized, our two-part baptism class is for you. Chuck McFerrin will be facilitating the baptism course on October 2nd and 9th at 9 a.m. Our baptism ceremony will take place on Sunday, October 23rd at 2 p.m. Also, starting on October 2nd is our brand new Trinity class. If you ever had questions about the Trinity, we invite you to join our college minister, Christian Running, as you work through this challenging and very interesting topic together. This class meets Sunday mornings, October 2nd, through the 30th at 9 a.m. To sign up for any of the other upcoming Equip classes, stop by the info table or contact the church office. The nationally known program, Financial Peace, is coming to Cornerstone. Church member Ken Cecil will facilitate this nine-week course on biblical money principles that work. This class meets Monday evenings starting on October 3rd at 6.30 p.m. Childcare is available with registration. Sign up at the info table today or contact the church office. Finally, Moms Inc. would like to invite all moms and caretakers of children at home for a once a month Friday fellowship. This event will be a time for moms to refresh and connect with one another while their children participate in various STEAM-based activities. Registration is required for each event and our first event is Friday, October 7th at 9.30 a.m. Please visit cclb.org slash momsinc to sign up. Again, we are so glad that you joined us here at Cornerstone. Please join us as we continue into a time of worship and teaching. Good morning, Cornerstone, and good morning to our, our broadcast audience as well. Cornerstone, um, we're all together now in the house of God, in the presence of the Lord. Wherever you are, the Lord is there with you. And so I'm glad to welcome you into the fellowship of believers here as well as around the world. And uh, this morning, we have a great, great privilege because I want to introduce to you a man that some of you have met before, but um, many of you have never met. He is the general director of the Ethiopian Kalehewa Church. He's come all the way here as general director, as a partner in the ministry. Let's welcome Dr. Malatu. Good morning, my friend. Wonderful to see you. Our partnership with Cornerstone Church and the Kalehewit Church uh, goes back now numerous years. Uh, 2013 was my first connection with the Kalehewit Church, and then 2015 and 16. Now we've finished four years of pastoral training with 15,000 of your pastors uh, in your church. So tell us a little bit about what that ministry has meant to the Kalehewit Church. Uh, I would like first to bring greetings to you from the Ethiopian Kalewat Church, to all Cornerstone Church members. Uh, we're very grateful for our partnership. Um, our church is uh, a church with 11,000 uh, local churches, over 10 million members. So, and it's a very, uh, it's, it's growing very fast. So taking care of all these people Giving the pastoral care is a big responsibility and a huge <laughs> challenge. So we are very grateful for the partnership with Cornerstone. Uh, we started this partnership four years ago, and we have been able to train the pastors of many of these churches. Started with 15,000, but now we have about 13,268 pastors meeting regularly to study uh, about pastoral ministry and uh, we'll go through the books yes. that are covered. And we have been blessed. The church has continued to grow. We'll be 100 years old uh, in, in uh, 2027. Uh, so our, our target by 2027 is to double uh, the number we have now, from 10,000 to 20,000, from 10 million to 20 million. And people say, how do you double in six, seven years? You, it took you 93 years to get here. <laughs> 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 but what we say is, we ask every local church to plant one more church in the next six, seven years. And we're asking every believer to bring one more person to the Lord. Could be their kids, 
family members. So that means we need more pastors to pastor all these coming new churches. Mm -hmm. So we are very grateful that this partnership came at the right time, and God has really blessed us, and the pastors and the churches have been blessed very much. Well, it's, a, it's an extraordinary movement of God in the world today. This whole story of the Kalahewa Church and what's going on in Ethiopia, it's, it's unlike anything that I think we've probably ever seen in, uh, on the continent of Africa. There's such a movement of God uh, there. And um, it's so exciting to be a part of that. And of course, old style training of pastors where they have to go to school for many, many years uh, is not the way to, to actually train these pastors because they need so many of them, it's not possible. And so what God has done is raised up a brand new way of training pastors, and uh, we've been working together. So it's had some tremendous outcomes too, like for example, false teachers, which you, when your last time you preached here, you spoke about false teachers, false prophets, false apostles, false doctrines that afflict the church. Yeah, we have, uh Pastor Jerry's four books have been used effectively in our context. The books were translated, and the pastors come together to study it. The first one was pastoring the flock of God, and it uh, taught our pastors about their personal call, how they can take care of their own spiritual life, their family life. That was very helpful. And the second one was preaching the word of God. That helped our pastors to preach the sound doctrines of the Bible, to focus on the Bible, to feed their flocks a true teaching of the scripture. A third one, as Pastor Jerry mentioned, was defending the flock of God. We have many false teachers, false apostles, false prophets, and they use the media uh, to teach these uh, false teachings. And it has affected our members. So this book has equipped our pastors to identify false teachings, false teachers, how to defend the flock of God from these false teacher teachings. And the last one is Maturing the Flock of God, which is a, a book that really helps our pastors to understand the basic doctrines of the Bible that are foundational for their Christian faith. About 90% of the pastors have completed all the four books, and some of them will finish soon, and the graduation is coming uh, We're this January. Forward. That's right. In January, hope to travel there, God willing and see these pastors live and be able to congratulate them after four years of training. They've been very faithful in all of that. So there's something new, Dr. Malatu, that is happening. It was a vision that you had two years ago when you assumed the role of general director of the Kalahewa Church. And when we were asked, what is it your vision is, what is your vision, you said, I'd like to see uh, media. I'd like to see us raise up a whole new media. So what has happened in the process of all of this vision? Yeah, in relation to the false teachers that use the media very effectively, it's hard to protect our people from these false teachers because they are on media in the living rooms of our believers. So we needed to start a media ministry. That's what I shared with uh, the leaders of Cornerstone and um, by the help of the Cornerstone Church, we were able to purchase the equipment that's needed to set up a studio with the cameras, lighting, and all that. And we have set up a studio, and uh, we're going to launch uh, our satellite TV ministry uh, November, this coming November. So the Lord has really blessed us, and we have good teachers, but not that many who have gone through Bible schools, Bible colleges. We can put them on TV and they can reach millions. Kaleo Church itself has about 10 million members and the evangelicals in Ethiopia are over 25 million. So reaching out to all these people through this media with sound biblical teaching is a priority for us. And the Lord has blessed us and we're very close to, to launch this TV ministry. And we are very grateful for the support we have received from Cornerstone Church. Please continue to pray for us as we start this ministry, and it will reach out not just to people in Ethiopia, but to our neighboring countries, even to some parts of the Middle East. And we are looking forward to this ministry. Wow, that's a lot. Did you hear all of that? That's amazing. That is amazing. Thank God. 
And uh, I want you to feel, I want you to embrace this personally because it is yours in the Lord. You have been the ones to support and to raise this up and the vision that Dr. Malatu has for a television station broadcasting 24 hours a day, preaching the word of God, teaching the word of God and having children's events and all kinds of youth type of tel television viewing for people that will be viewing it, be looking at it because the saturation of the internet in Ethiopia is not as strong in other as other places in other countries. And so everyone does have a television. And so this is a way to get to everyone the, the word of God and sound teaching, as you said. We are so grateful to have you here. And we're so honored today that you would be here and take the time. Uh, I would have you preach, as I did last time. Uh, but I did not know he was coming because his visa was held up and then suddenly it happened and so I was so happy that, uh, that you were able to come. I would like to pray over this, but I'd like to call upon Dr. Habtamu, our missions, international missions pastor, the president of CTN, uh, also a, a, an Ethiopian, a fellow brother in Christ to come and to pray. I would like you to pray for this ministry, this media ministry, and Habtamu, I would like you to pray in English as well as in Amharic, if you would, please. Would you stand as we commit this ministry that is ready to launch uh, uh, out of the Kalihiwa Church, out of Cornerstone Church? Let's just pray and, and commit it to the Lord. Thank you, our Heavenly Father, for this partnership between Cornerstone Church and Kalihiwa Church. Lord, uh, you blessed this partnership. Out of this partnership, Lord, miracles are happening. Lives are transforming. And Lord, uh, it's beyond our imagination. Lord, we pray for your continuous blessing upon this partnership. Yes. And Lord, thank you for Pastor Jerry. Thank you for Cornerstone Church leadership. Thank you for people who are generously giving for this ministry. And Lord, uh, we are also praying for Ethiopian Kaleo Church. Lord, uh, we pray for this, uh, the media ministry. Uh, Lord, bless them with uh, all the needs they have. And Lord, uh, provide for their needs. And uh, we pray that, Lord, use it for your glory. Yes, Lord. And Xavier Amla Kachin Hoy, Benazre to be Jesus Christos, Bendezi Aine Tuneta, Andlai, Yemengistin Srandin Sarasilere Dan Tameskin. Aun Zare Beziguba Emakakel Bekibur Tegain. Maninyom aine tetsno nak ember hulu be Jesus Christos menas sultan itu sebarai hun. Ye yanda nun so hiwat antenika in the mighty and powerful name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 Let's let's give the Lord praise before we see what even has happened. He's done great things, great and mighty things. Thank you so much. Remain standing. Let's worship together. Let's invite our worship team. Let's thank God for them. Hello, Cornerstone Church. Let's worship our great and mighty God today. Let's all sing together. Come, come, let us worship our King. Come, let us bow at His feet. He has done great things.
bow with me as I pray for the service this morning. Lord, open our eyes, open our hearts. Help us to see you for who you are. You are our faithful God. You are our great God. And you certainly have done great things. As we heard this morning with the Ethiopian church, in the continent of Africa, you have done amazing things beyond what we would imagine. So I pray this morning that the work and your word there would continue to fall on fertile ground and that even now you would continue to do things that are above and beyond even what's planned, as great as it is. Lord, but you've not only blessed that church, you've blessed this church and from the very beginning. And you continue to be faithful and you continue to do great things in this church. But not only that, you've done great things for us individually. You've given us life. Give us the eyes to see people the way you see them. You gave us life and you loved us even when we were sinners. Your word tells us you willingly went to the cross. You died for us even when we were far from you to bring us into relationship with you that we might have eternal life with you. And that is an amazing, great thing. We worship you. We praise you for it. Lord, help us to love others. We love because you loved us first. So help us to see people the way you see them. Speak powerfully through Pastor Jerry this morning. Open our hearts. Have your word penetrate that we might be more like you and bring more people to saving faith in Jesus. Now, as an act of worship, we return our tithes and offerings, just a small portion of what you've blessed us with, and we want to honor you with it. Lord, bless our offerings, multiply them, use them to further your word here and throughout the world. We pray this in your name, Jesus. Amen.
You formed me with your hands, known and loved by you. Before I took a breath, when I doubted, Lord, remind me I'm wonderfully made. You're an artist and a potter. I'm the canvas and the clay.
Those songs were perfect preparation for today's message because uh, we've been fearfully and wonderfully made. There's no one in this audience, there's no one watching this broadcast who is a mistake. You're all here on purpose. You're all here as a wonderful creation of God. We've been answering the question, what is man in this series? What is man? You would think that that answer would be an easy assumption, and yet today there is such hostility toward a biblical view of almost everything, including the definition of man and woman, that we need to go back to the Word of God. We need to sink back into Scripture to understand who we truly are and uh, take it seriously and embrace it. In this series, we began with an answer to what is man that and took us to Genesis chapter 1, the creation of man. And we've been made in the image of God. In the image of God, we've been created. And so we've also learned that God created them male and female. We explored that whole series in this series, that whole realm of gender and sexuality. And then we looked uh, at how we are free yet fallen. Free yet fallen. And... Uh, the side of us that is broken, and we saw how Scripture clearly teaches us about the brokenness of humanity, this tainted image which God has created, has been changed, has been corrupted, has been tainted. And, uh, and so today we're going to take a look at the beauty, the sanctity, the, the blessing of life itself. In fact, it's going to take us to the seminal passage of this entire series where the question in Psalm 8 is asked, what is man that you are mindful of him? Well, like myself, many of us grew up in the era when psychology and sociology were in the early stages of development, and evolution, uh, that theory, ruled the science of origins. This is how we were taught uh, these disciplines attempted to answer the question, what is man? Typically, they answered it without God. Secular evolutionary theory relied on a dubious notion that, that matter, the matter in the universe, the building blocks of life in the universe, had no first cause. Nothing caused it. There was no reason for it to be. There was no creator. Therefore, if you really look underneath the assumption of what they're saying, they're saying that matter is eternal. Think about that for a while. Macroevolutionary theory basically says multiply chance times billions and billions of years, then add inorganic chemical matter coming together in a such fine-tuned ways that today science says it's impossible, and voila, you've got humanity. I was taught to believe this. Without any overarching guidance, our universe produced an impossible set of random biological mutations and adaptations over hundreds of millions of years, and Homo sapiens emerged. It's exactly what I was taught. At the time, I didn't believe it. I still don't. <laughs> Psychology proposed to explore the uncharted frontier of man's internal mental, emotional, and volitional state and offered solution to man's internal problems. While sociology, how many of you had to take sociology? Mercy, you poor people. Um, <laughs> sociology attempted to describe humanity by dividing us into our unique cultural and tribal contexts. I'll stop here for just a moment to let you know that next week I'm going to speak on the issue of race. Most Christians, even today in the church, do not understand what the Bible says about this important topic. They usually learn from their parents or they learn from culture, but they do not know what the Bible has to say. I will open the scripture to you and you will be shocked. You will be blessed to hear from the word of God. That's next week. Well, what were the outcomes of science, of uh, evolution, of psychology and sociology? 
In the end, all of these academic pursuits tried to answer the question, what is man? But the results were devastating and depressive. According to evolution, man is the animal descendant from a one-cell organism randomly advancing through a chance system where survival of the fittest is the key to understanding man's past, present, and future. In other words, man is a random freak of nature with no purpose other than surviving over other weaker creatures on the planet. Think of it. Psychology answered the question, man is a mental and emotional collection of competing motives, drives, anxieties, and phobias. Therefore, man's advanced brain capacity creates conflicted internal emotional climates that disturb and defeat us, so man needs a lot of therapy to overcome this. <laughs> Keeps them in business. Sociology. Man is an advanced social animal who seeks to organize in tribal communities for safety, preservation, and reproduction. So what's the result of this? What's the bottom line? In the answer, what is man from a humanistic, secular viewpoint? Without God, man is an eat or be eaten animal. Without God, man is a freak, a mistake of nature. Without God, man is a disturbed mental and emotional animal with self-defeating instincts. Without man, God, man competes and wars with other men to enslave and dominate other peoples and their societies. So if man is defined in these secular terms, what are the outcomes that might be expected? Well, number one, man has no dignified origin. Secondly, man has no significant purpose. And thirdly, man has no great eternal destiny. How depressing. How defeating, how sad, how remarkable, trivial all mankind would be in that mindset. No wonder human life is so expendable. No wonder some people want off the planet. No wonder our youth are confused about who they are. They've been taught this. The world's answers, I have to tell you today, are untrue. They are false, even though they are widespread and accepted. Everywhere, young men and women, boys and girls, are succumbing to this despair, this feeling of despair that tells them that there's nothing permanent. Life is futile. There is no real purpose in their life. We're all living out our days in a hopeless tangle of meaninglessness. As Shakespeare put it in Macbeth, life is a tale told by an idiot full of sound and fury signifying nothing. The result is the violent attempt by some people just to grasp what life there is for the moment, what pleasures there might be. And so now we are living in the full bloom, the flourishing of nihilistic existentialism. You hear even our politicians uses the word existential often. They don't even know what they're talking about. I've studied it, and they're not even using it correctly. Out of the awful sense of frustration and meaninglessness, suicide rates among our youth are skyrocketing. Think of all the kids that you think are good kids who are now, unfortunately, even taking one fentanyl pill, and the next thing is their parents are notified that their child, their precious child, is dead. This happened over 100,000 times. Think of all the families. One dead child affects not just that family, think of all the friends, think of all the extended family, think of how tragic this is in America today. But our kids are like the canary in the, in the cave, in the mine. They're telling us that the words that they are getting, what they're told to believe, is killing them. Politicians define man as subjects to rule over, to control. How can we control these people? Big business will define us as consumers of goods to be exploited for profit. Big tech defines us as a commodity to be bought, sold, controlled by their self-serving algorithms. 
Now that I've thoroughly depressed you, <laughs> and I needed to, because you need to understand and understand where society has brought us. What the people in charge have told us about us. Now I want to turn the corner, open the Bible, and help you to see what God says about you. Because it is shocking in a good way. Turn to Psalm 8. Psalm 8. The question has been the genesis of this series is found there in, in Psalm 8. And it begins this way. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory above the heavens. God is greater than all of his creation. Out of the mouth of babies and infants, you have established strength because of your foes to still the enemy and the avenger. When I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars, which you have set in place, what is man? Here's the question. That you are even mindful of him and the son of man that you care for him. Yet, you have made him a little lower than the heavenly beings and crowned him with glory and honor. You have given him dominion over the works of your hands. You have put all things under his feet all sheep and oxen, all the beasts of the field, the birds of the heavens, the fish of the sea, whatever passes along the paths of the seas. Oh, Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. And so this psalm begins and ends. These are bookends with this great theme of the majesty and the power and the greatness of God, our creator, in all the earth, in fact, in all the universe. This is literally a call to worship. This is saying, come before the Lord and look at his majesty. Appreciate him for who he is and his greatness. And then verse 2 teaches us that even a small child, a little child, can comprehend the majesty of God the Creator, while people that are proud of their knowledge and of their education and of their degrees, those people rage on and deny man's origin as a creation of God and man's worth, as I just told you, as I explained to you. You know, you sit down with a little child, you tell them that God made you. God created the heavens, the stars. Look at the moon tonight. And you'll see a little child's eyes open with wonder. And this verse tells us, God says, I'm going to have the little kids rebuke the old folks that think they know what they're talking about. Verse 3 turns our gaze upward to study the order the incomprehensible design and exquisite beauty of our, of our whole solar system that God created. When I look at the heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon, the stars that you have set in place. Wow. In other words, take your eyes, look at the sky above you. Go out to the desert. Get away from all the lights of the city. Go up to the mountaintop where there's no ambient light and just look up on a clear night you'll be awestruck. How vast is the universe in which we live? I think back in the time when David wrote this psalm, you know, he's a shepherd boy, right? He's out every night. There's no ambient light other than maybe a flickering fire. That's it. You think he saw a little bit of the stars and the glory of the heavens, the beauty of it all? Of course he did. You know, we have to, we have to measure it in light years. Think of that. A whole year in which light moves so fast. Quasars, black holes, spin, revealing the mysteries of God. He's placed it all in his universe. How tremendous is his power over all these things. And it is he, according to Colossians 1, by him all things are held together. Jesus Christ is actually, God is holding the entire universe together. You know, uh, in science... They have, um, they have a terminology 
because they don't really understand why space works the way it does and holds together. They call it dark matter. That's just mean they don't know what they're talking about at this point. <laughs> the fact is, is that we live in a miracle. Every moment we live in a miracle. Verse 4 poses the main question, what is man that you are mindful of him, the son of man that you care for him? And so David, the psalmist, compares man's relative minuscule size against the vastness of the universe. But even more now, he comes to this and he says, man's seemingly insignificance against the infinitude of God, our creator. It's just amazing. Why would God even give a, a passing thought? Why would he even care about mankind? And then the answer comes, and it's astonishing. In fact, it's more astonishing than you even think. Verse 5 defines man in glowing terms. Yet you have made him a little lower than the heavenly beings and crowned him with glory and honor. At first glance, this verse sounds profound, but it is actually infinitely more profound than you even actually think. Because when you look at the, the Hebrew, you look at the original language, it literally reads this way. You have made him a little lower than God. What? Yes. God. You say, well, how did the... Some of you have translations say angels. Some of you say heavenly beings, which was my translation. And yet, oh, here's a Hebrew lesson. Everybody ready? Repeat this after me. Bereshit, Bereshit. bara, bara. Elohim. Elohim. Those are the three first words in your Bible. In the beginning, God, Elohim, created that's the same word used here, Elohim. That God has made us a little lower than Elohim. That's Hebrew. Now, how did it get to be angels? It's, it happened um, the third century BC when the Old Testament was translated into Greek by 70 scholars in North Africa. It's called the Septuagint. And in their minds, they just seemed too awesome and so they decided to change it to angels in the Greek. But the original text, the Hebrew text, reads Elohim. Now, listen carefully. This is a most amazing assessment of who we are. I don't need another lesson in self-esteem. I need to understand what God says about me. And by the way, I am not God and neither is anyone on this earth. That's blasphemy. But the Bible teaches us that God has created us a little lower. Well, I think there's actually an infinite distance. <laughs> but the Bible says it. God has created you, he's created me with this infinite value. Now, has it been messed with? Has it been corrupted? That was last week's message, <laughs> free and fallen. And yes, we got messed up along the way in the garden, and we've made it even worse. We've compounded evil in the world, have we not? And so now, though, this passage is teaching us something. According to the Bible, God made man to be the expression of his life and work on earth. We're the human vehicle of God's presence in the world. Redeemed man was created to be an instrument of God's hand, to manage his creation, to build his kingdom. Redeemed man is designed to be the expression of God's majesty and power and his divine character. We're to be like Christ. We know this. Man is the creature nearest to God, we've been made in his image. There's nothing in all of creation nearer and dearer to God than man. Even more astonishing. Those of us who are redeemed, the Bible teaches us and Jesus taught his disciples 
that God himself had made a plan. And the plan was to actually live inside of us. Jesus said to his disciples, I will ask the Father. He will give you another helper who will be with you. How long? Forever. You know him for he dwells with you, but he shall be on the day of Pentecost. He shall be what? In you. If you don't have the Holy Spirit in you, you don't belong to Jesus. It's as simple as that. But if you belong to Jesus and you've been redeemed, you are in indwelled by the Holy Spirit, and you can be empowered by the Holy Spirit, and the life of Christ can be lived out through you by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen? Amen. That's the good life. That's the one you've been called to live. It really does take man from here, and it puts him here. It's beautiful. But there's more. Even more, it says he's crowned him with glory and honor, and that is for the redeemed. Romans chapter 8, for I consider the sufferings of this present age not worthy to, to compare to the, what? Glory that shall be revealed to us. For creation waits at, with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. There is something yet to come about you and about me as followers of Jesus. And one day at the foot of the throne of Jesus in heaven, you're going to look at this old mug of mine. You're going to go, whoa, dude, you're glowing with God's glory. And I'll look back in your face and I'll say, you are too. This is exactly what God said. It will be spectacular, crowned with glory and honor. This is what God has planned for us. What an enormous contrast to secular humanism and how the world has defined us as man. Bertrand Russell, some of you know that name, the high priest of atheistic humanism, said this of man, and I quote him. Brief and powerless is man's life. Of him and all his race, the slow, sure doom falls pitiless and dark. Anybody want to follow that guy? I don't. And when I studied philosophy in university, I rejected that man. It's a sad, sad, pitiful individual who's godless and who was actually very smart but mindless. Now, I want to take you to uh, Psalm 139, because we've been Psalm 8, and we've looked at the, the telescopic view to answer the question, what is man? Now I want to take you into the microscopic view, beginning in verse 13 of Psalm 139. Psalm 139. It says, for you formed my inward parts. You knitted me together in my mother's womb. I praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works. My soul knows it well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was being made in secret, intricately woven in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw my unformed substance in your book were written, every one of them, the days that were formed for me, when yet there was not one of them. How precious to me are your thoughts, O God. How vast is the sum of them. If I would count them, they are more than the sand. I awake, and I'm still with you. Well, there's no reading of this without understanding the beauty, the glory of God forming, hand forming each and every baby in the womb of their mother. Verse 13 reveals that God is at work shaping and forming an unborn child. In verse 14 he says, I'm fearfully and wonderfully made as the psalmist examines himself. Even before the, quote, scientific age, he's amazed at the vitality, the complexity of the forces in his body that are essential to life over which he has absolutely no control. He is convinced that he's been made by an infinitely great creator. 
in complexity and beauty and intelligent design, and yet with a soul to connect with God. It's the, it's the message of the Bible and of the gospel. Disconnected because of the fall, now we're reconnected through faith in Jesus Christ who came, who lived a perfect life that I can't live, who died on the cross and shed his blood for my sins and rose again on the third day that I might have everlasting life. Amen? Amen. Have you ever stopped to think of how your life, your physical life, is dependent upon automatic systems that you have no control over? Think of all the different systems that are working right now in your body. Let's hope that your brain is working (laughs) as one of those systems. But think of all the systems, even your own heart. You don't sit around and go, okay, heart, I want you to beat now. Okay, I'm going to run, so I want you to beat faster, and you have to think about that. No, it's just automatic. It's all automatic. Your nervous system, endocrine system, digestive system, it's all just automatic. You don't think about it. It's just what happens. And so God is, God is at work. God has put these things in place. God has put all of this into motion. Every breath that you take, do you understand? Every beat of your heart, it's God who is pushing this forward. He's the one who's making this happen. Don't be so proud. This is what the psalmist got to. He says, what is man? Why would you even think of me? Then he started thinking deeper, and he went, wow, God. Verse 15, my frame was not hidden from you when I was made in secret, intricately woven in the depths of of the earth. In other words, God was seeing us even before we were even before we were in our mother's womb. When our bones were being knit together, they were being formed, we were being shaped. And now with the advance of medicine, we've we've actually get, gotten inside a mother's womb. It's made it accessible, and it's an impressive demonstration of God's miraculous work in forming a baby. Aren't you glad that God put you together? Can you thank him that you actually have bones? Say, otherwise you'd just be a shapeless blob, pastor. (laughs) Then it says we're knit together. I remember, when I read this verse, I remembered my grandmother. She would take a ball of string, like it was her generation and the way they used to do it, and she'd sit there with a ball of string and a couple of knitting needles, crochet needles, and she would make lace. And we go, you took that and you made that? That ball of string? Yes. Beautiful. Think of how God has knit you together. It's a beautiful picture. All of us need to stand back and thank God. And then look at the planning. We sang about it earlier. God is working all things together for our good. He says, Your eyes saw my unformed substance. In your book were written every one of them, the days that were formed for me, when yet there was not one of them. In other words, God's intricate plan for you preceded your birth. He saw you. He knew you. He understood you. He planned for you before you were even born. In fact, Colossians chapter 1 says he actually redeemed you before the foundation of the world. Wow. Such wonder. Such a great God. This is a biblical view of man. It is not down in the dumpster. It's not in the dustbin. It's not in the garbage heap. No. No. The Bible teaches us where man is in God's planning. It's glorious. It's amazing. It's astonishing. That's why God hates sin. Because sin destroys the very thing he loves. He says, stay away from it. Because it's ruining you. Well, God saw me at the moment of conception... I didn't see myself. (laughs) God knew me. God knew you. He shaped you when you were just an unformed substance in your mother's womb. What does this say about the the unborn? What does this say about 
when life begins, what does this say about human life that needs to be protected <clears throat> in the womb? Well, the Bible's pretty clear here, isn't it? It says that God ordained the days for you. God saw your unformed substance. God planned you. Before you were born, God even set the number of your days. I'm going to be here until God says, Jerry, it's time to come home. So you have to put up with me? <laughs> That's the way it's going to be. Now, some, some live a long life. Some live a rather difficult, sickly life. Some live a short life. And some never see the light of day. And yet, from this scripture, from what you've learned today, every single life has eternal value. Everyone. Everyone. By the way, doesn't that say something about what Jesus told us? He says, oh, the greatest commandment is to do what? Love God with all your heart, soul, mind, strength. What's the next? Yeah, why? Why? Because that's the way God is. That's how you ought to treat other people. Because you know what? They're made in God's image. It may be defaced. It may have a lot of issues. But they're still made in God's image. You see the value of life here. Now, <clears throat> we go from that to verses 17 and 18, which reveals God's love for us. How precious to me, he says, are your thoughts, O God. How vast is the sum of them. If I would count them, they are more than the sand. I awake and I'm still with you. What a beautiful poetic statement of truth. Right now, God is thinking precious thoughts toward you. More, pick up a handful of sand next time you go to the beach. Let the grains of sand fall off your palm of your hand and remember this psalm. Because God is thinking about you. He's thinking about you in precious ways over and over and over and over and over again. How precious are your thoughts toward me. More than can be counted, more than the sands of the seas. I wake and I'm still with you. It's, it's amazing, is it not? Well, you have now heard a biblical view of man, very different than the world. The world has trashed what God has created. The world has defaced what God made to be beautiful. The world has driven man to despair when we should be driven to God who created us, who has lifted us up and has great plans for us. Because this body, it, it's, it's a weak body. It's a natural body. It's a mortal body. But one day, according to 1 Corinthians 15, God's going to change all of that. At the resurrection, this becomes not a mortal body, but an immortal body, transformed. It's not a natural body anymore. It's a spiritual body. I can move at the speed of whatever God gives me to get wherever I want to go. I don't need a car in heaven. <laughs> and it's sown in weakness, but it's raised in power. I don't understand it all, but I know God's power that's what he has planned for you, my Christian friend. What an amazing view this is of mankind. So let me give you 10, as I close, 10 implications of these two Psalms and the biblical view of man. Number one, God considers all life sacred and valuable, sick or well, young or old, all life, all life is precious. Number two, life begins at conception. In God's mind, he had planned before conception, but it begins on this earth at conception. Three, unborn babies are precious human beings and must be protected. Today, in the parking lot, we have uh, the Horizon Pregnancy Center here in Long Beach represented, 
and uh, the director is here with us this morning. Deborah, would you want to stand, please? This is Deborah Tews, the director. So grateful for your ministry, so grateful. It's, it's, it's Bible-based. It, it honors the Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, this church is in total and complete support of this ministry. You can tour their van out in the parking lot and take a look at what they're doing. They have offices in Huntington Beach and Long Beach. It's because they believe what I've been talking about. Do I get an amen? Amen. Abortion is killing a child made in God's image. Now listen to carefully, because I know that I'm talking to someone who's either counseled someone to abort or chose to abort, and now looks back and says, what in the world did I do? Listen to me carefully. The world has pushed people and pushed people and pushed people, and their message has gotten through that life is expendable, it's cheap, and you can just push it out. You can destroy it. We now know that that's not God's view. Here's the good news, and listen to me carefully. I quote scripture. The blood of Jesus Christ God's Son cleanses us from all sin. Rejoice in this and move on in victory. Number five, rescuing unborn, an unborn child is a noble moral cause for the church and Christians. Number six, helping a pregnant mother keep her unborn child is compassionate and right. Your life, number seven, is eternally significant to God, so never allow yourself to think otherwise. Satan is a killer. Don't listen to his voice. Listen to the voice of the God who created you and who loves you. You've been told how much he loves you today. God plans specific things for you to do, so find God's will and do it. Do it. You're, if you're breathing, there's a purpose for you to be here. It's not just for you either. It's for the working of God through you. Nine. The sacrifice of Jesus, the Son of God, places infinite and eternal value on believers. And 10, in heaven, God will crown believers with glory and honor. These are all true facts. This is how we live our life. This is the biblical view of man. Let me close with this. It's a story, a true story, of a man named Theodore Geisel. He had a dream. His dream was to write children's books. Unfortunately, his wacky style in illustrations, as he sent it to publishers, 21, 21 publishers said, absolutely no, we reject this work, we're not gonna publish this. Finally, Theodore Geisel found a friend who conceded and said, okay, I will publish your work, but I will only do it under an assumed name. And here it is. Dr. Seuss. (laughs) Well, today his books are classics, sold in the millions all over the world, and they make you smile. And so I thought as I close, I I wanna read one of his books. It's called Happy Birthday to Me. Listen carefully because, listen to me, your birthday counted. It counted to God, and it should count to you as well. Okay, so here's how it goes. A little wacky, but fun. If you've never been born, well then, what would you be? You might be a fish or a toad in the tree. Or worse than that, you might be a wasn't. A wasn't has no fun at all. No, he doesn't. A wasn't just isn't. He just isn't present, but you, you are you. And now, isn't that pleasant? 
today you are you. That's truer than true. There is no one alive who is, who is youer than you. <laughs> Shout aloud, I am blessed to be what I am. Thank goodness I'm not a clam or a ham or a dusty old jar of gooseberry jam. I am what I am. That's a great thing to be. So I say to myself, happy birthday to me. <laughs> the day of your birth was a great day. I don't care what the circumstances were. It was a great day. It was a great day to your God who made you, who blessed you, and who calls you by name. And you're bound to be crowned with glory and honor. Wow. Let's pray. Father, how difficult for our puny minds to comprehend and even to embrace with the, the gift of faith, which is what we all need, this high view of man created in your image, created for great purpose and high calling and value and worth. Lord, forgive us for the way we've treated one another and thought of one another of less value or of ex one is expendable or not necessary. God, please forgive us. Help us, Lord, to embrace what the Bible teaches us so that we treat one another with love as you have loved us and we value every precious life. Lord, we give this all to you. We ask for a change of mind and heart to come in line with your holy word. I pray in Jesus' name, amen.
Well, I know this has been an uplifting service for me. How about you? Yeah. Been, been blessed? Yeah. On your way out today, if you want to visit the van uh, for the Horizon Pregnancy Center, please do so. Take, your, take a peek inside. And let me just say this. Some of you who've had medical experience or have been counselors, they need some help. Uh, they need some volunteers. And so if you are of that mind and God is calling you to do that kind of thing, to step into that place, to, to say you are worth, worthy and so is your child. Um, please, uh, please see Deborah, who is here this morning, or go to the van and say, I'd like to talk to you about volunteering. Well, may the Lord bless and keep you. May he make his face shine upon you. May he lift up his countenance his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen.